Welcome to the Fantasy Golf Bag Podcast, presented by FantasyGolfBag.com, your number one source for the most in-depth PGA Tour analysis in the daily fantasy and sports betting world. Each week, our experts will discuss everything you need to know, from the course preview and key stats, to top plays, fades, and strategies. Whether golf betting, grinding out cash games, or playing for a big GPP win, our team has you covered. Let's get after it. Welcome back, everybody, to the Fantasy Golf Bag Podcast. I'm your host this evening, Red Kachik, and I'll be going solo for the Zozo Championship Um, being played over there in Japan for the first time an event's been played since like 2012 I think in Japan so um, new golf course we'll try to touch on as much as I can for what we know uh, on the golf course and uh, obviously look at the players and some of these Japanese players I think are worth considering this week Um, as opposed to last week with the Koreans it was a little bit more uh, hit or miss mostly miss so um, let's go ahead and jump right into it obviously limited field again 78 players, no cut event, uh, a bit stronger in my opinion than last week. So we'll get into the players here in a second, but I will touch on like the golf course in general. Um, obviously, it's a par 70, 7,041 yards. It's being played at Accordia Golf, Nirishino Country Club in Japan. Um, very tree lined. A lot of dog legs. It's actually a mixture of two golf courses. So if you go to the Accordia Golf website, um, I think this is like a privately held golf club in Japan. It's got two golf courses. It's got the Queen and the King. And this is a mix and match of two of those. Um, Not necessarily breaking apart the nines, you know, like the front nine of the King and the back nine of the Queen. But it's definitely mixing matching holes. So if you are looking for the course layout, definitely use the PGA Tour website. Uh, I think they have a course preview. Or you can use the actual tournament website, which I think is like zozochampionship.com. Yeah, zozochampionship.com. Um, but yeah, this is a golf course is very tree-lined and a lot of dog legs. So my first you know, feel for the golf course is it's going to be very driver um very driver focused on accuracy guys trying to hit it to a certain part of the dog leg uh obviously trying to stay out of the rough most of the dog legs so like as far as the tree line goes it's tough to tell if they can carry many of the dog legs um from what i could tell with the photos the trees looked a little bit too close to the tee box for them to cut a you know a straight dog leg left and cut the corner too much um obviously if you know rory's over here on a big dog leg left, he could hit a big swing and hook over it, um, over it or around it. But the dog legs uh, run through. So, like you, th- you think about it, it's going down the fairway, hanging left um, into the rough and into the trees. There's actually a decent bit of room. Like it's tree line, but it's they're not terribly in play for how the golf course is set up. So, not too concerned with that. I think guys are gonna you know tailor back just a little bit. Uh, to keep the ball in play, it's it's not so much a driving accuracy golf course because it is pretty short. Um, it is a par 70, very short par 3s. The par 5s have a little bit of meat on them. But it, I just don't see, if you're going to be looking at this golf course and think, you know, this is tree-lined and it's you know it looks a little bit tight and narrow, guys aren't going to play it the same way they would play anything else. So definitely, if you do want to look at accuracy, use the weighted driving accuracy in the the rolling stats that we have it's going to give you a better idea of a golf course where like last week um for example where weighted comes in huge uh, i think it was jordan spieth hit over 70 percent of the greens and he ranked 55th in that field so like weighted he'd be pretty far down the list but if you're just looking at green and regulation numbers for the season and you throw in a 70 percent which everyone was hitting 75 80 percent of the greens last week it's going to look like he hits a ton of greens, and it's and it's not true. So definitely use the weighted stats for most weeks. It's going to be very beneficial, um, but certainly earlier in the season and trying to use some carryover from the Tour Championship, the BMW Championship, etc. Look for the weighted ones because guys are going to play this golf course focused on keeping it in the fairway. They're not just going to be bombing drivers on a golf course with low rough and stuff like that. So that'd be the first thing. Uh, looking through like overall stats, 
it's going to be pretty standard this week as far as looking at approach. Um, it's hard to tell what the scoring is going to be like. I think it's going to be pretty low scoring in terms of, uh, again, a fairly high green regulation number. Not as high as last week, but pretty high just because they're going to have a lot of shorter irons in. And the putting should be decent on these greens. So I would think that birdie, birdie or better is going to be a pretty big stat this week. Um, I do want to look at strokes gain total. Uh, it's a pretty strong field in general. But looking at lead-in strokes gain total, I think, has been pretty helpful in these no-cut events. Um, so looking at that, and like I said, there'll be some Japanese players down at the bottom we'll get to here in a minute. Um, not lo- really looking at too much on proximity. Uh, obviously, the EAP stats, we don't have data from the... CJ Cup, so not looking too much into those projections, but definitely keep an eye on guys that have been hitting it well to start the fall. If they've played any of the fall, a lot of these guys, this is like the first time you've seen it. Um, You can definitely add off the tee. It it does incorporate distance with uh, accuracy, and that's a pretty decent metric overall. Um, Don't mind that at all, but approach is going to be the big one this week. Green regulation, you can add add in. Again, it's going to be a weighted version. And then birdie or better is going to be pretty big. So you can kind of mix and match as well with the way the field is set up. But uh, pretty standard. It's going to be looking at a lot of recent form, um, trying to look at some of these Japanese guys. I I will say, as we kind of dive into the pricing, my feel for this course, um, or I'm sorry, this field over last week, this is more of a balanced build type of week for me. Even though it's a no cut event, if I'm building a bunch of lineups, then sure, yeah, I can, you know, I can throw in Rory McIlroy with a uh, Xander or something like that and try to mix and and pair up a, a very cheap Japanese player or Adam Long who's sitting there at 6,200. Um, it's not a bad week to do that, but when you go down the pricing, there's a lot of good values, um, quote unquote values in like the 9K range and 8K range that have a I would argue a better chance of winning on this golf course than guys over 10K. So that's my kind of take on the pricing in general. This will be more of a balanced build versus last week. I really hammered the the stars and scrubs route. I think I had just under 300 lineups total last week and 72% of them had JT. I think another you know 12%, something like that, had JT and Brooks combined. That didn't work out because Brooks WD'd. But definitely JT, I mean, he was he he rated out way higher than anybody in the field. And it just made sense. If he's going to win it, you're going to want him in your lineup. So went very heavy on JT. And this week is the opposite. It's going to be very light on this 10K range. Certainly JT and Rory at 11.5 and 11.8 um, on DraftKings. But balance build for me um, in comparison to last week. And then kind of with the golf course being an unknown, it, it lends itself – to kind of rely on more of the known players, guys I do think that are going to play well. Last week, with it being so forgiving off the tee and forgiving on the greens, we saw a lot of that with, you know, Wyndham Clark playing well, uh, Danny Lee playing well. I feel like that's not going to be as um, easy this week to get a guy that doesn't hit it well from tee to green getting through. So, that's pretty much it on the course. If you do want to watch like the Golf Channel this week and get a feel for it, um, I think lineups lock at around 10 p.m. Wednesday night, so again, an early lock. But try to get a feel for the golf course. That's that's my take on how they're going to play it. Again, I, I don't know if guys are going to be trying to rip it over any dog legs. There could be a few that they can, um, but definitely seems like most of these, you're going to have to work it with the dog leg, not over it. And I don't think the tree line is going to be as big a deal as maybe others think because the dog legs do have forgiveness through those fairways versus um, they come again really fast. So it does look like a little bit of a European style golf course. So you can kind of view that uh, to how you wish looking at some of these guys like Fleetwood and uh, Fitzpatrick. They've played really well in these style courses. So um, that's pretty much it on the golf course for now. Um yeah, let's go ahead and dive into the players. We'll start, uh, obviously, DraftKings pricing, and we'll start at the 10K plus, and we'll work our way down into the 6K. Um, there's a few in the 6K I do like. Um, like I said, I'm not going crazy scar- stars and scrubs, but there are a few down here that are really interesting, and I'll, uh, I'll point those out that <laughs> they're probably not better players long-term than these PGA Tour guys will see, but I do think for this tournament in this field, 
Um, that's probably the leverage that you want is getting one of these unknown guys that have actually been playing extremely well. And hopefully you can, you know, he finishes top 10, no one plays them and bingo. So let's hit it. Let's start with the high end range. JT coming in at 11, eight Rory McIlroy, 11, five, um, a little drop then to Hideki at 10, seven Xander, 10, four, Paul Casey, 10-1, and Jordan Spieth at 10K even. Um, it, it's very tough. Like the one guy that I'm interested in playing here is Xander at 10-4. Um, have a lot of you know respect for his game, and he plays well in these fields. I at 10-4 for me, that's that's a pretty good value, quote unquote value. Again, it's it's a limited field. You're trying to you know figure out what actually makes sense in lineup construction. Hideki's interesting. I think at 10-7 for him, he's in play for sure. I don't know what his ownership's going to be like. I honestly don't know what this golf course, um, like being back in his home country, playing in front of his home crowd. Like in Japan, these Japanese golfers are like celebrities. Like this is a big deal for him to be back there. I don't know how that how that plays out, if that helps his motivation or if he's just so um, distracted that he, he's not motivated. I'm not sure. Usually Japanese players in general are are pretty disciplined, so I expect him to come out and play well, Um, but he's not a priority for me. My priority is going to be Xander over a JT and Rory. Um, Probably won't have any shares of JT, to be honest. Rory might fit into some GPP builds, and Paul Casey coming off a missed cut on the European Tour a couple weeks ago. He graded out well for me, but it might be one of those that if he is popular, it's going to be an easy fade. Right now, I'm on the fence. I had a lean fade, but um, if he's coming in super low owned for some reason, I'll be happy to hop on some Paul Casey. But it is worth kind of considering if he's coming off of a miscut a few weeks ago and he shows up in this field, um, people aren't looking too much into the European tour stuff. It's, it's a good opportunity to kind of avoid that chalk if he becomes that way. Um, and then Jordan Spieth, who knows? I, I played him last week. It worked out fine. This week, a little bit different style golf course. It takes the driver out of your hands a bit. But I, I again, 10K for him seems a bit rich. I'm not sure if I can get there. Um, I ended up plugging in. I think on the podcast I mentioned doing you know, three to five lineups as main lineups last week. And that's usually what I do in the, in the higher dollar stuff. But then when I looked at the way the field was and the way JT ranked for me in his ownership, I was like, this is a good opportunity to, to take advantage of it. Spieth may be that way this week. If he's coming in at 5% again, um, maybe throw him and Paul Casey uh, and Hideki or something like that, depending on where the ownership lies. It may be one of those, you know, Wednesday morning, it, it seems like a good idea to, to go ahead and give some additional lineup, some love with uh, some under guys in this limited field. No cut event. I mean, you're basically getting four rounds. You're just trying to get someone that's going to make a ton of birdies. We know they can both make a ton of birdies. So moving down into the 9K range, this gets interesting for me. The There's a couple guys coming off of last week that played really well. Um... The probably my favorite on this style golf course is going to be Morikawa, and Morikawa is American, but he's he's got a Japanese history um, or heritage, I guess. And again, it's, I'm not worried about a Japanese narrative, but 9100 for him is just too good of a price. He's been extremely consistent all season. Um, played, he won the Barracuda, which was an alternate field event, but even outside of that, I think he's gained strokes in all but one event through those um, probably a dozen tournaments he's played in since the U.S. Open. Um, He's a tough one for me to avoid. He's going to be, he could be pretty chalky. We'll kind of see how that plays out. But this is a range that I like a lot. Morgan is going to be number one for me in value. Um, Fitzpatrick's not far behind him at 9K. Like if you look at Fitzpatrick and how he's played over there on the European tour, um, I think he had a win back in the summer Um, But even in his last four events or last five events, he's had two second place finishes, a 26th, a 46th and a 69th. So like the two second place show a good bit of upside. And some of those were not on courses that really suited him. So I do like him quite a bit. And he hasn't been playing a lot on the PGA Tour. So again, take into consideration 
most people playing DFS are going to be so focused on the PGA Tour and how people have been playing in the fall swing or what their PGA Tour stats say. And some of these guys aren't going to have very many. So use that to your advantage. That usually will show up in the ownership, but um, sometimes it'll be inflated a bit and you can get a good opportunity. Like for me, I could start two lineups or I could start a lineup with two of those Morikawa Fitzpatrick and you got a decent amount of salary to work with in that 8k range which aren't that far below some of these values in the 9k Um, at least on this golf course again it's kind of dependent on the golf course Um, the rest of these in this field um, or in this range Tommy Fleetwood 9800 um, totally fine with that again he had kind of had a rough go last week finishing 20th I I know people had high expectations I, I certainly did um, not the end of the world. It's a, a unique golf course and may not have suited him on the greens. It's one of the tougher courses to put on. But yeah, Fleetwood at 9,800 is in play for me. Woodland coming off another good finish. Um, he finished third last week. And again, a course where, from what I can tell, it's going to be mostly a club down off the tee. We know he's, he's done extremely well in courses like that with Pebble Beach, um, the Mayakoba tournament. I like Gary Woodland quite a bit at 9500 again. I think relative to the field and this golf course, that's a pretty good price for him. Um, probably fair, but again, it's worth paying the price for him. Uh, Victor Hovland, I'll probably avoid in this field. Tiger, I, I don't know what to make of him. Obviously, we saw him in the Skins game Monday night or Sunday night. But again, we don't know what his health is. We don't know um, where he's been really working on his game if he's going to come into this event and if his knee gets tweaked kind of like brooks last week he could quick withdraw and you're you're sitting on a bunch of dead lineups so I'm, I'm just hoping he gets some ownership and i can avoid it we'll see where that plays out again it's a limited field and i try not to harp on ownership too much throughout the season obviously if there's some cheap values that are getting 20 percent owned or something like that it's a good opportunity in full field events but certainly in a no-cut, limited field, the ownership in this range, these top ranges, is going to be key to uh, to give yourself some opportunity if others sputter. Um, and then the last one I kind of glossed over, but I do like Tony Finau. I think he's fine, um, but extremely consistent. He started off the season pretty well with a 10th and a 9th um, during this fall swing. So Finau, I do think this is a good golf course for him, to be honest. Like This wouldn't surprise me. If this is a type of course that, you know, gets his first real PGA Tour win, we're not talking the freaking Puerto Rico Open. Yeah, Tony Finau, plug him in this week. I think I think that bottom range there is going to take up a good bit of my ownership. All right, as we go down into the 8K range, uh, we get Jason Day, Sung JM, Ben on. A lot of names we saw last week. Um, for me, I was really impressed with Sung Jay. I know he didn't finish very well. But like for how he handled himself in his home country again on on Thursday, he played really well. I mean, he was flag hunting all day. He had a couple bad breaks um, flying it to like four feet and they hopped over the green. Um, But on this golf course, he's got to be in play for you. Like 8,800 for a guy coming off a win two weeks ago, a course that sets up. I mean, you look at his stats and how he gains strokes for the most part. Like he's had a few events in the last month or two where like the tour championship, he really struggled, but like the safe way he gained five strokes on approach Sanderson farms, three strokes on approach. You go back to um, the window he gained four strokes on approach and he's a decent putter. Like he'll have a few bad weeks putting, but he's also one, if it, get, it becomes a birdie fest, he can kind of keep up with the best of them in terms of making making some putts. So Sungjae for me, um, certainly in play. I'll probably avoid Day. Again, It's I know Jacob will, will probably throw him in the contrarian corner again, and I don't blame him. Kind of did the same, um, yeah, the same for us last year where he would show up in these events with, very poor stats tee to green and he would just chip and putt his way to a top three or something like that <laughs> so i don't like chasing it i'll i'll let someone else do that he'll probably be low owned so i get it um but yeah the rest of this range is actually really good like ben on has been extremely consistent uh, we saw him open 
last week and on Thursday with a course record or two or one off the course record or something like that at Jeju Island, and he, and he finished sixth. Um, he's been extremely consistent, Tita Green. He's one I can rely on. Rafa Cabrera Bayo, another one that's a, a European tour staple. He's a bit more inconsistent in some of these fields, and I, I don't know why. Like he's he's very good in on the European tour, very consistent. He'll play in a few uh, events on the PGA tour, like he'll get into the Masters and, and play pretty well. But he just doesn't he doesn't pop for a lot of upside in these events for some reason. Um, it's a super good value again, eighty six hundred for him. He's right in the mid price of what your salary remains. I'll be using him. It's it's just a bummer that I don't know if it's his his putting or just his birdie rate. He's not hitting it close enough. He doesn't seem to hang in some of these lower scoring events. So he's definitely in play again. That low nine k going into this high eight k range is a, a big block for me in terms of of guys I'm looking for. Um, disappointed in Sergio last week. I. Plugged him in. I didn't have a ton of exposure, so luckily um, avoided too much destruction. But man, just Tita Green stayed consistent and did nothing on the greens or around the greens. Um, but Jokey Neiman at 8,200 is going to be an easy plug and play for me. I mean, he would be the one, if I'm looking at how I treated JT last week, um, Neiman hasn't been, obviously comparing apples to oranges but in this price range for 8200 neiman he would be one of those guys that i could easily have 60 to 70 percent ownership on and not really be too concerned again it's a no cut event you're going to get four rounds that's not a gimme it's not like you're you know locked into hitting value but it's also a good golf course for him tree line dog legs he's from chile that's a lot of the style courses that they play neiman Coming off his win, what, three weeks ago at the Greenbrier? Um, five weeks ago. Neiman's going to be in play for me um, pretty easily. Then the other two down here, Adam Hadwin, I think, is fine in tournaments. And then Shane Lowry is really interesting. Uh, I think he he was really popular. There was a European tour event like two weeks ago, and I can't think of what it was. The French Open. So the French Open or... I think it was the French Open, and no, that was last week. One of the Opens for the European Tour. Like two weeks ago, he missed the cut. Um, he was like 10-7, very, very uh, popular. But he's coming off of uh, 11th place and a 15th place the two weeks prior to that. He came in with good form. Obviously, we have all the European Tour stats on our website, and he was one of the easy ones, him and Andrew Johnston, who actually performed. But Shane Lowry wasn't like – coming in with terrible form and he missed the cut he was coming in with really good form burned a lot of people and now he's priced down here at eight thousand on a course that should suit him again so shane lowry is one of my favorite targets in this low range again it's as as i start building lineups and i see that i keep falling on a lot of the same guys that's when i'll feel like i'll want to add you know 50 100 lineups i don't anticipate getting to 300 like i did last week but that's the opportunities i see if i'm essentially building five you know quote unquote cash lineups because i feel like i'm so heavily invested in certain guys um so looking at jokey neiman and shane lowry down here at the low end and then at the top end ben on sung jay and rafa so a the ak range is pretty loaded for me um again that lends itself to the balance builds that i spoke of at the top of the show all right let's hit the 7k range um it is a bit stronger field than last week, in my opinion, and I think some of this pricing shows it. I mean, you get Ian Poulter kind of in the same the same price range that he was last week, and he finished 16th. I think he's in play on this golf course for sure. Uh, Ryan Moore, a very easy plug-and-play for, for most three maxes, single-entry tournaments. Um, I shouldn't say easy plug-and-play. Like You, you got to kind of make a decision of him over a Shane Lowry, but I do think if you're between like a Neiman and Moore, Neiman's an easier easier play. But um, Moore certainly sets up well here. Had a good finish last week on a course where green regulation numbers were super high. Um, kind of no surprise there, but he did end up making some putts, which helped his upside to finish eighth. Uh, and then he finished 13th, I think, two weeks ago at the Safeway. So 
Um, totally fine with uh, Ryan Moore. Kevin Kisner, I think, is fine at 7,600. We haven't seen much of him uh, this season. He hasn't actually played at all during the fall swing, but he finished the season on a high note, um, finishing 12th of the Northern Trust, 9th at the BMW, 9th at the Tour Championship. Um, very good putter. Most of those, I think, cumulatively for that stretch of events, he gained 15 strokes putting. Um, but he, he loses strokes off the tee to these guys in those bigger courses. So try to take some of those stats with a grain of salt. Like I said, the weighted stats do help out quite a bit when judging some of these players on these different tracks. It's not a this isn't a standard PGA Tour track. So the weighted will definitely come in handy this week. Um, Poulter, as I mentioned, Emiliano Grillo, uh, 7,500, totally in play, uh, continues to play well. Tita Green and last week finished 26, so not too impressed with that. Um, but it became a putting contest. And this week could be some of the same, but at 7,500, uh, if he finishes 26, he's more than likely paying it off and he's got room for upside into the top 15, possibly top 10. So he's definitely in the player pool. Um, the rest of these guys down here, Matthew Wolf finished almost dead last last week or third to last because Brooks and uh, JB Holmes decided to withdraw. Uh, probably won't be trying to chase that at all. But Ches Reeve, um, again, he sets. He seems like he fits this golf course mold quite a bit. Like we talk about Gary Woodland on these less than driver courses. Ches Reeve is a different style of player where he's not clubbing down on less than driver courses, but he's very consistent tee to green on these courses. You think about Pebble, a lot of the West Coast swing tournaments that he plays well on. Um, he finished 46th last week, which isn't really surprising, to be honest, on a, co- a golf course that's somewhat long. You got guys bombing it because the fairways are essentially 40, 40 yards wide, 30 yards wide, something like that. Like the guys are going to be bombing drivers and probably having 50 yards less than Ches Reeve into most of those par fours. Um, so not surprised there, but I do think he's set up well in this golf course and he's very, very cheap. I mean, relatively in this field, 7,400 for him. We saw him 9K. Um, granted, not as strong of a field, but of like the, the Shriners or the Safeway, he's approaching 9K, if not over 9K. So consider that a little bit in this type of field it it's not so cut and dry with pricing where you're like yeah i saw you know so and so at nine nine k at the greenbrier well you know the greenbrier is a weaker field but ches Reeve is consistently priced up towards 9k in tournaments like the pebble beach pro-am stuff like that so 7400 for him seems like a, a pretty good value um I think Lucas Glover is fine. Rory Sabatini is fine. Again, those are two guys that set up pretty well in this golf course. And Danny Lee is probably not going to make it into my lineups. He did not make it into them last week, um, but totally fine avoiding him after a a good showing last week. I have no interest in that. Um, There's a couple of Japanese players. So as I kind of look down into the 6K range, again, I, I try to hold some of these as I narrow down my values because I, especially in a limited field, it's easy to just name off the seven or eight PGA Tour players that you know that have decent form coming in. And, oh, yeah, you know, these guys are 8K normally, and now they're 6K. It's a great value. We, we hear that spiel all the time. So I try not to just uh, give a canned response on those guys. So I try to save them for my article. Um at fantasygolfbag.com. So you can check that out. Last week, I gave a lot of the pivots for the ownership. And I'll probably do something similar this week, depending on where my lineups go. Uh, but the as far as the Japanese players, there's a couple that are worth considering. And like I said last week, the, the Koreans that were in the field, just they don't have the pedigree that the PGA Tour players they were playing against had. And you're paying... You know, 6,400, 6,200 for them, but they have no upside. Like, literally, you would be picking one out of a dozen that maybe can finish inside the top 20. And it just, I feel like that's just burning too many lineups. This week's a bit different. Um, one of the guys that I think is going to be, uh, he possibly could be popular if you're looking at recent form, 
But Shugo Imahira at 7,100 is a Japanese player. Very good Japanese player, I should say. And he's coming in with, let's see, 10 straight, sorry, 7 straight top 12s. Um, one win a couple weeks ago. Been extremely good. Like I, I don't have a problem playing him, but I this is a um, early in the week. I, I assume he's going to get some ownership. I'll be avoiding him and actually going down. So there's one Japanese player that I think is terribly mispriced, and that's Yo Ishikawa at 6,400. Um, he let's just let's just kind of backtrack just a second on him. He's got 145 career starts on the PGA Tour. Like he's a he's a PGA Tour player. If you guys have been around PGA DFS for you know a number of years now, you recognize this name. If you're an actual, you know, you actually play golf, you've probably heard his name since he turned pro when he was like 16. Like the, the guy's pretty good. He just lost his tour card a few years ago. Um, he's actually so good. He made the FedEx Cup playoffs in the 2013 season and the 2014 season. Um, which is pretty impressive. I mean, you you get guys like um, was it Kokrak or somebody trying to to just creep through a couple levels of the FedEx Cup playoffs. Yo Ishikawa actually made it in both years. Um, he ended up losing his tour card in 2016. Um, he tried to get it back on the Corn Ferry Tour and finished 31st. So ended up losing it, going back to Japan and playing on the Japan Golf Tour. Um, he has two wins since July. And I think it was the PGA, the Japan PGA Championship, and the Shigeo Nagashima Invitational. Seka, that's a pretty cool name. Uh, so he's been playing really good. If you look through, you know, compare him to um, Shugo Imahira, I think I think Yo has a lot more upside, and he's got a better price tag. So I'll be plugging in a decent bit of Yo again. It's Man, you know, the, the guys on the Japan Tour, they're not going to play the same level of golf course that the the PGA Tour guys play on a week-in and week-out basis. So I would always recommend, like to our members, you look for the PGA Tour guys down here that are mispriced before trying to plug in a, a Japan Tour or Korean or whatever the native area is. Um, but I do think Yo at that price is a, a very good a very good opportunity. Jazz isn't too far behind him. I know he burned some people last week, but he's a very good player. This course is going to be similar to what he sees every single week. I'll be going right back to the well there. And then our boy, Adam Long, sitting there at 6,200. Um, I guess disappointed in terms of finish last week, finished 46th. But I think in terms of scoring, he was like around 26th or 28th, something like that. Um, continues to pay it off. So I don't love him as much on this golf course. I probably will do an outright bet and probably a top 10. I'll have to talk to Skyler or Axis on that. Um, it's 6,200 is a pretty good price savings, but uh, I don't know. I feel like this golf course isn't as suitable to him as uh, last week, but I need to have something on him because it's Adam Long and his EAP numbers are just absurd. So um, the last one that I'll mention, and I'll probably defer a little bit to to Skylar and Axis because they know the European tour guys a lot closer than myself. Um, but Sean Norris has had a crazy run of form back in, um, say, the end of August through through now, and he's down here at 6,200 as well. I don't know what his ownership will come out to, but he's one. He's like his last five events, he's gone second place, ninth, tenth, first, um, 26 seconds. So his last six events, very good form, and he's very cheap. Again, those are the style of golf courses that he played. I think he finished second to Yo in one of those events that he won. So you can kind of see a balance there between those two. Um, the other ones down here, I know Satoshi won on the RBC Heritage. Again, it's not as set up like that so i wouldn't pay too much attention if people are trying to make comparisons but there's not a ton else down here um von taylor 6100 kind of stands out but again you're, you're trying to pair out your pair up your lineups to the best of your ability and if you want to avoid the top guys because i don't think they have the best opportunity to win on this course that the mid-range does i don't think you really need to go down that far um 
but trying to get a little bit cute with a Yo Ishikawa, a Sean Norris, etc., I think is the way to go for me and GPPs. Uh, but for the most part, it'll be pretty balanced. So that'll pretty much do it on my end. Again, I'll I'll be posting out my updates in Slack throughout the week. And then, uh, of course, the article will be published probably Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, depending if I want to wait for ownership to shake out. Um, and then, like I did last week, I posted my entire um, or my top 10 player exposures. So that's where the the Justin Thomas one came in came in pretty helpful just to look at where I was really leaning for my lineup construction. But I will uh, I will let you guys go. I appreciate you guys tuning in to the Fantasy Golf Bag podcast as always. Uh, if you can, you can always leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. That always helps us out. I um, actually don't know if you can do ratings on Android or, or Spotify, but either where, anywhere you can do it, that always helps out. Um, if you're listening on YouTube, give, definitely give us a thumbs up. That helps. And uh, excited to kind of roll through this little uh, Asian swing as we get into the end of the year going get almost to what Halloween is next week. And then we got Thanksgiving, Christmas for all the you know American holidays. And we'll be back to the tour championship or the tournament of champions before you know it. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Check out the website, fantasygolfbag.com. Uh, you can use the code FALL19 to get 20% off your subscription and you get access to the PGA Tour, European Tour data and tools. Of course, our articles and projections, and we will be wrapping it up um, as we go into this little break. But good luck this week, guys. Appreciate you tuning in, and uh, we'll see you Sunday with some screenshots. See ya.